Good evening and welcome to Tucker Carlson tonight. The question this evening, are we headed toward war? Not another intervention in a small country in the Middle East, but a big war with nuclear weapons on both sides and tens of millions of lives at stake. Despite a failed missile test over the weekend, North Korea is not cracking under international pressure. Its ambassador to the United Nations warns that, quote, thermonuclear war may break out at any moment. Now, they overstate quite a bit, but still strong words. Both President Trump and Vice President Pence spoke today about all of this, saying the administration plans to adopt a new posture toward that country, one that is more assertive than taken by any previous administration. Here's part of what they said. We'll see what happens. I hope things work out well. I hope there's going to be peace. But, you know, they've been talking with this gentleman for a long time. You read Clinton's book. He said, oh, we made such a great peace deal, and it was a joke. You look at uh, different things over the years with President Obama. Everybody has been outplayed. Uh, they've all been outplayed by this gentleman, and we'll see what happens. But I just don't telegraph my moves. It was more than some quarter century ago that we first learned of the presence of nuclear weapons on the Korean Peninsula in the possession of North Korea. Uh, there was an agreed framework. There was a period of strategic patience. But the era of strategic patience is over. So what does this all mean, and more to the point, where exactly is it going? Harry Kazianis is Director of Defense Studies at the Center for the National Interest, and he joins us tonight in the studio. Harry, this looks like something very ominous to me. How seriously should we take it? This is extremely ominous, Tucker, and, and I, I want to set the scene a little bit here because I think we need to know what we're talking about. Uh, just a few, a few days ago, we had a missile test out of North Korea. Yes. Obviously very troubling, very conservative. But imagine what could happen if one of those missiles actually landed in Seoul. Let's say, for example, a missile th did its test and it, it crash landed in the wrong place. Accidentally. Accidentally, saying. right. I can tell you, if that landed in a populated area and killed people in either in, in Japan or in South Korea, either one of those countries would respond. In response, the North Koreans are going to do something. And we have to keep in mind that the, the amount of armaments the North Koreans have. Right. They have 1.1 million men under arms, 7.7 .7 million in reserve. They have not just nuclear weapons, but chemical weapons, biological weapons, over 1,000 missiles. So this is a very dangerous situation. This is a mini slow walking Cuban missile crisis. We have to keep that in mind. What's so striking, though, is their promise within the last 24 hours to continue with nuclear and missile tests. Should we take that promise seriously? And if so, what does it mean? Oh, absolutely. The North Koreans, I guarantee, are going to keep testing missiles. Keep in mind, in order to build missiles that are ICBM capable, in other words, something that could hit the United States, it takes a lot of tests. They have to test the tracking systems, the telemetry, the heat shield when it goes into the atmosphere and comes down on its target. That takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of resources. Uh, also, we have to keep in mind to build nuclear weapons you have to keep testing them yes. think about the united states and russia and how many times we tested uh, nuclear weapons over the years sure. it, it was literally hundreds of times now i don't think the north koreans are going to need to do that but they are going to keep testing and tensions are going to keep rising so my understanding of american policy at this stage is we're not going to put up with that we're saying we're not so what does that mean exactly they, they continue to do this how do we respond well i, I think there's two things that we can do i, I think that the, the president has sort of laid out a, a message saying that you know, the, the, the era of strategic patience is over. And, and I think it's important to sort of set a line to say, look, we are not going to take it if you, you launch an attack on South Korea and Japan. But I think there's only two things we can do here. The first thing that we need to do is we need to contain the North Korean nuclear and missile programs from growing anymore. Now, how you do that, you have to apply secondary sanctions, or very tough sanctions, so nobody in China or Iran or any other country can basically assist them. Because if they assist them, they need to be made an international pariah and they need to be outed. The second thing we need to do, and this is a little controversial, but I think it, with President Trump being a pragmatist, I think we can do this. We have to talk to the North Koreans. I know that's vile. They're, they're a terrible regime. They have over 200,000 people in prison camps. They have one prison camp that's actually three times bigger than Washington, D.C. But, but we're in a tough spot here, and the only way to try and mitigate a crisis is to have some sort of channel with them. And I think that's what we need to do. Do you think that's possible? I mean, if the United States government announced we're, we're talking with North Korea, I mean, there would be an immediate uproar. You're legitimizing the Stalinist regime. You're absolutely right. And this is how I think you'd have to do it. I think the Trump administration would be wise not to announce it on Twitter or something like that. But I think you could go through back channels. This might be something actually the Chinese could actually help us with in a very pragmatic way. There are different European back channels you can go to. And you can go to the regime and say, look, let's have an open-ended dialogue. 
There, there's no, you know, fiat compli, no, nothing specific went on the agenda. Let's build some trust. Let's try to talk this through. The, the risks are just too great at this so, point, Tucker. Uh, so a couple questions. How quickly could this spin out of control? Very quickly. I mean, all it would take, in all honesty, is, is you have this heavily armed, demilitarized zone with hundreds of thousands of troops. Let's just say a North Korean soldier gets nervous and fires off a bullet. Imagine a South Korean sentry fires off another bullet. The North Koreans fire off artillery. That's how fast it could all unravel. Very, very quickly. If the North Korean government feels cornered, China apparently exerting pressure on that government, obviously the United States doing the same, other countries too. How does it respond? Do we have any sense of how they'll respond if they feel really under threat? Well, I think when we think about Kim Jong-un, we don't know a ton about him, but we do know one thing. We know human nature, and that's he wants to survive. Yes. He knows his regime is hated throughout the world. They're a violent and nasty regime, but that's why they have nuclear weapons, and that's why they have all those weapons of mass destruction I was talking about, because they know it's the ultimate asymmetric weapon to deter the United States. So that's why they have those weapons to sort of hold the, everybody at back and bay. But I think it's very dangerous to sort of pick, put Kim Jong-un in the corner, because the danger here is miscalculation, Tucker, and that's what we have to avoid more than anything else. Is all of this finally an argument for keeping American troops in the Korean Peninsula where they've been since 1950? or for pulling them back to get them out of harm's way. No, I, I think, Tucker, you have to keep U.S. troops there as basically a, a deterrent to Kim Jong-un to know that we're involved, that we're present. I think Trump did the right thing in moving a, an aircraft carrier battle group right off the coast. I think that the, to the talk has been very tough, but I think it's been prudent. But now that, that, that we've established these norms, I think now it's time to talk to them and see what might be able to be accomplished. It's a terrifying moment, and, and I think it's probably not getting the attention it deserves. Yes, thank so, you for doing that. Thank you, Harry. I appreciate it.